Hello and welcome to our monthly Zoom and communion service. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Pauline and I'm one of the deacons here and I'm leading the service this morning. And a little bit later on, John, who is also one of our deacons and also our church treasurer, will be bringing God's word to us and leading us in communion. As we meet together to worship, I'm going to read just a few couple of verses from Revelation chapter 4. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honour and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. And we're going to echo those words as we sing our first song together. Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. Father God, we just want to thank you that we can come into your presence, that we can bow before you, the one who art worthy, the one who art worthy of all our praise and all our honour. And Lord Jesus, as we meet in this service this morning, we pray that you will accept the worship that we bring before you. Lord Jesus, it may be weak and it may be feeble, but it comes from hearts that love you. And Lord, we thank you that we're reminded that even though you are so powerful and so mighty, you love each one of us just as we are. And Lord, that is so amazing. And so we want to come and stand before you, the King of Kings, and bow before you in praise and worship. Amen. And so we sing again, King of Kings, Majesty, 
Your Majesty, I can but bow before you now. I'm glad Kevin, um, Martin has put that picture up about the church meeting because I've had an email from Kevin asking me to make sure that the church meeting was plugged today. So you've all seen the advert now and this is just a final reminder that it is a four o'clock today on Zoom and we hope that all of you will be joining us. Right, now I like bags. I have a real tendency to buy bags and I think um, I would probably say that I have more bags than I need. Actually, that's not true. I know I have more bags than I need, but I can't resist them. There's just something about it. And um, I have another one here. Now, I have a habit of when I go on holiday of buying a bag. It acts as a souvenir of the place that I've been to but it also is something practical which I can use rather than just buy something and put it in a cupboard or a drawer. But on the last holiday that Fiona and I went on, and in case you don't know, Fiona's my daughter, um, this was back at the end of 2019. Some of you will remember the days when we could just go on holiday and not worry about where we were going or what we were doing. But I made this promised to myself that on this particular holiday, I was not going to buy a bag. I was doing quite well. I got through the first few days and I hadn't bought one. And then it happened. 
I saw this bag that I really, really liked. But I decided that I wasn't going to buy it. And I must admit, I felt quite smug about it. You know, I was, well, I'm very good. I didn't buy it. But as the holiday wore on and I kept seeing this bag around, I thought, you know, it looks so pretty. It's so different. It's really unusual. I really would like that bag. And so, as you may have guessed, I bought it. Now, what I didn't know when I first saw this bag, that there was a story to it. And I'm sure that some of you that are much more travelled than I am will probably know exactly what this bag represents when I show it to you. And there it is. I don't know how well you can see that, but it has two rows of very pretty little dolls on it. I'm looking at John at the moment to see if he knows what they are. And he doesn't. Right, okay. These are actually worry dolls. And I discovered that if you um, put one of these dolls under your pillow every night for a week, all your worries will be gone. Well, you and I know that that's not going to work. These are lovely little dolls. They're just made of either a piece of very stiff cardboard or a little piece of wood wrapped in some material and a very pretty little face drawn on them. But they can't do anything. They're no good. They're pretty useless apart from looking quite pretty. <clears throat> but when I heard, <coughs> excuse me, when I heard, excuse me, um, <coughs> just losing my voice a bit here. <coughs> when I heard the story about these dolls, it had two effects on me. One was it made me feel quite sad. The reason I felt sad was because there are so many people in so many countries who actually believe these type of things. And they don't know that there is someone who can really help them with their worries. And the other thing it made me feel was it made me feel very happy because I know that I don't need these little dolls to take away my worries because I have someone that I can turn to. And that someone is Jesus. There's a verse in um, Philippians which says, don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. Now when we come to Jesus and we pray to him about our worries, He's not going to just take him away like a puff of wind. Sometimes that does happen, but not always. But what Jesus does promise us is that when we have worries and fears and anxieties and we take them to him, he will help us through them. He gives us the strength to cope. He walks through our problems with us and he will be there all the time, he will give us his peace, and that is amazing. Now, I've had a bit of a problem this morning. I was getting ready to come to church this morning, and just before I was coming out, I went into the bathroom, and I opened my bathroom cabinet, and out fell a bottle of nail varnish. Now, that nail varnish broke, and it went everywhere. It went all over my clothes, my skirt, my top. It went up the wall, all over the floor. Fiona heard the commotion and came rushing up to me and said, what's happened, what's happened? And I said, well, I'm in a bit of a mess. And she looked at me and kind of went, oh, you are, aren't you? And then she looked at the floor and the walls and everywhere. And she just said to me, what's your story about this morning, Mum? And I said, not to worry. And she said, well, that's what you've got to do. Stop worrying about it all. So I came out to church and left Fiona just to clear it all up and hope that it's all sorted when I go home. But you see, that's just a bit of a fun story, really. But when we have serious worries, 
Jesus is the one that is there. Now this bag actually hangs on the back of my bedroom door. And the reason it's there is because it reminds me to pray for the people in these countries who just don't know Jesus and who don't know he is the one who can help them through their worries. And the other thing the bag does is it reminds me as I go out of that room, first thing in the morning particularly, I know that I don't need dolls because I can turn to Jesus and he will help me through any worries, any fears, any anxieties I have. And you know, there's a song that says, do not worry about anything, but turn to Jesus. And I have three friends, Max, Katie and Jacob, and they are going to sing that song for us now. Firstly, I'd like to say a big thank you to Doug Hawley for um, giving permission for us to use that song with puppets um, this morning. Secondly, I'd like to thank Fiona for all her hard work in um, doing the puppets for that song. I'd also like to thank Kevin who did the filming, which was not an easy task. And also a very, very special thanks to Martin and Harry for all their work in putting it together. That actually had to be filmed in three separate bits and Martin and Harry have made a brilliant job in putting that together to make that one video. So a special thanks to them for all their hard work. Now we're going to have our reading. Our reading is going to be in two parts and it's going to be shared between David and Rachel Morgan. 
And in between the two parts, we are going to sing another song, which is, um, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 11. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven.
Acts chapter 1, continuing from verse 12. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language Acheldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism, baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justus, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of those two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the 11 apostles. Just pray together for a moment. Lord Jesus, we just want to pray for John now as he comes to bring your word to us. Father, we pray that um, the words that he brings will be the words that you have given him. And we just ask that we may have hearts that are open to your word, ears that hear what you have to say to us. And we just pray your blessing on John and on us as we listen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Last week, we have seen some relaxing of restrictions as we exit from the lockdowns due to coronavirus. Certainly, there's been a lot of traffic on the streets and people in the shopping areas. But the government has set out various tests we need to pass before the full release of lockdown can happen. We're in this in-between period where we have some relaxations but also some restrictions. We're also now in the period between Easter and Pentecost. And today I want to look at what happened between Jesus' resurrection on Easter Day and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Why was there a gap of 50 days? Why didn't the Holy Spirit come immediately? We will look at various events which help provide reasons for the gap and things which needed to happen. And as we look, we will jump between the Gospels and there's also one reference from Paul's letters. Starting at the empty tomb, we read that John believed when he went into the tomb and saw it was empty. But according to Luke, Peter went away wondering what had happened. 
Jesus, is, Jesus needed to appear to his closest followers to show them that he had risen from the dead. But we have him first appearing to Mary in the garden, and she thought he was the gardener and then the disciples after that. In the afternoon of Easter Day, we read in Luke chapter 24 from verse 13 of the two on the road to Emmaus. Jerusalem's social media was beginning to spread stories and fake news was beginning to emerge about what had happened. It's not just a 21st century phenomenon. We read in Matthew 28 that the chief priests gave the soldiers money to say the disciples had stolen the body. As the two talked about all the news as they walked with Jesus, they may not have known the truth. Even though it took Jesus to explain from the scriptures and the prophets, but still they didn't understand they did not recognize Jesus until the end of the journey and after they had invited him in for a meal when he broke bread with them. Later this morning, we will break bread in our communion service and I pray that our eyes may be open to the Lord as we share together. The two then hurried back to Jerusalem we don't know at what time they arrived, but later that evening, we read in John chapter 20, Jesus appeared to the disciples, but Thomas was not with them. A week later, Jesus appeared to the disciples with Thomas now present. We looked at this in more detail last week through Ken Benjamin. Only after Thomas had seen Jesus, did he believe? Jesus commends those who have not seen but believe. Ken did tell us last week that Thomas was courageous, honest and worshipful in both his doubts and his response which came at the end, my Lord and my God. Doubts are a valid response. People have reacted in different ways to COVID and the lockdown. And as we come out of lockdown, there will be those who will need to see what is happening before responding to it. We need to support those who have doubts and are cautious. With the fake news circulating, it would have been easy for the disciples' claim of Jesus being alive to be dismissed. So Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 6 that Jesus appeared to at least 500. It's also in this uh, section that we read that Jesus appeared to, to James. This was Jesus' brother, not the disciple. And it was this James that went on to lead the church in Jerusalem. If we hear of an incredible story from only one or two people, we might doubt it. But when hundreds can confirm it, it's easier to accept the truth. At every step so far, as we've gone through these passages in the New Testament, people have doubted what has happened. It shows that despite all Jesus' teaching before he was crucified, this was such an incredible event, people found it difficult to grasp. But it did happen. This last week, the nation has been mourning the loss of Prince Philip. He died privately. But if he now appeared, there would be shock and doubt. Jesus died publicly on a cross, seen by many, including the disciples, so no wonder many asked, how can he now be alive? But he was. From Jerusalem, we moved to Galilee, and we meet some of the disciples returning to their fishing in John chapter 21. In their minds, now was the time to go back to their old ways. Jesus had come and gone, 
and they felt they had to do something. But going back was not what they expected. Despite all their skills, they fished all night and caught nothing. As we come out of lockdown, just going back to the way we did things may not be right and may prove fruitless, or should I say fishless. When Jesus told them where to fish, they caught a huge catch. We need to ensure that we are guided by Jesus as we restart activities so that we can get the catch that Jesus wants for us in terms of reaching fishes of men. Moving on to the lake shore, we find Jesus needing to confront Peter following his denial. Note that Jesus did not punish Peter. Rather, he got Peter to affirm his love so that the denial is put behind him. Last month, we had Deeper with Dr. John Andrews, and John gave us an excellent session on reconciliation and forgiveness. It was session five. If you haven't heard it, then I commend it to you. It's available on our website. It helps us understand Jesus' approach to Peter. When you read the passage, you will see that Jesus did not ask for forgiveness from Peter, but asked for his love. Why did Jesus ask Peter three times? The superficial answer is that Peter denied Jesus three times. But I think it was deeper than that, in that Jesus wanted to ensure that Peter truly put the denial behind him. The first response, Peter said he loved Jesus. The second, he recognized his forgiveness. The third was full reconciliation. Perhaps as we begin to move forwards, we need to reconfess our love for Jesus so that where we have gone wrong in the past, we can come to Jesus and put th these things behind us. In our reading in Acts 1, and also in Matthew 28, we are told about the ascension of Jesus. Before he ascends to heaven, we read at the end of Matthew 28 that he gave the Great Commission to the disciples to go into all the world. Three things I want to draw out from this, uh, this passage that are often overlooked. Firstly, the disciples came together to worship Jesus in verse 17. Before we go out, we need to come together to witness. We need to come together in Jesus' presence to worship him and then go out in his strength. Secondly, we are told that some still doubted again in verse 17, a recurring theme through all the situations we have looked at this morning. And despite Acts chapter 1 and verse 3, when we are told Jesus came giving many convincing proofs that he was alive. Thirdly, we need to reflect on the enormity of the Great Commission that Jesus gave in verse, 20, verse 19 of Matthew 28. This was to a group of people who had probably been no more than 100 miles from home, Galilee to Jerusalem. But now they are tasked to take the message to the whole world. Until recent years, we have seen the Great Commission as meeting together and witnessing to our local community as a church and sending out or supporting a few people who have gone overseas to serve the Lord. Now with technology, we're beginning to understand that we can reach the whole world through our services and other online activities. Do we need to be reminded of the commission we inherit as we move into new situations out of lockdown. Jesus departs, but still no Holy Spirit. Looking in Acts chapter 1, which we read together, 
it tells us that the ascension of Jesus took place after 40 days. In the second half of the chapter, we read of the appoint, need to appoint another apostle to take the place of Judas Iscariot. After all, with the whole world to reach, a full team is needed. We've been known to carry out a deacon's election in the lockdown. And this passage in Acts speaks of needing to ensure all leadership roles are filled so that the load is shared. This doesn't only apply to deacons, but to all roles in the church as we seek to reach people in various ways. As we come out of lockdown, where can you start to help serve within the church? Our activities depend on all of us playing our parts. We have seen things stop in the past, not because they are not fulfilling a need, but rather because we have had insufficient people to keep them going. Let us not see things fail because we are unwilling to help. It was only after all that I've mentioned had happened that it was right for the Holy Spirit to come, which we read about in Acts chapter 2. And when he came, the change was huge. But that's for a future Sunday. As we come out of lockdown, are we ready for the Holy Spirit to do something new in us? Are we ready if he wants to make significant changes in the way we do things? Some things will continue because Jesus is in them and the nets are still full of fish. But for other things, maybe the net is now empty and we need to move on to things new. We have seen at every stage there were some who had doubts. We can easily take the, the events of the first Easter for granted. But for the followers of Jesus, to accept he had come back from the dead after seeing him die publicly on the cross, it's not surprising that some had doubts. Maybe you are someone who has doubts about Jesus, his resurrection and his saving power. You are not alone, but as Jesus met his disciples, he is meeting you today. Are you ready to say with Thomas, my Lord and my God? In a few moments we will share communion. May we use the time to reflect on the deep love poured out on the cross and the amazing power of the resurrection. May Jesus show through the bread and the wine convincing proofs to take away any doubts we may have. Amen. And we will now sing as we come to communion, Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace. Around the table of the King yeah. The body of our Saviour Jesus Christ Torn for you Eat <laughs> and that heal the death that brings us life, paid the price.
that cleanses every stain of sin shed for you. Drink and remember he drained death's cup that you may enter in to receive the life of God. So I share in this prayer We come to communion. As we gather around the Lord's table, all are welcome, including those of you who have doubts but want to meet Jesus. This is not a secret service. However, Jesus gave the model to his disciples to remember him. So in taking the bread and the wine, we are remembering Jesus' sacrifice on the cross in our place. Let's read what Paul wrote about the communion service in Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For in, whenever you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We'll now have time to reflect and examine ourselves in quiet.
Lord, as we come to this table, you know our doubts and fears. But Lord, we come because you fulfilled the supreme sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, you gave the words through to the disciples to take this bread and this wine in memory of you. And Lord, we thank you that we can come to this table this morning. Lord, pray that we may meet with you in Jesus' name. In coming to communion, we do not need to be perfect. Only Christ is perfect, which is why he could die for us. But in taking the bread and the wine, we are showing we accept Jesus' death for us and thanking him for it. And Dave will now offer a prayer of thanksgiving for us. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, it's been a strange week. Well, it's been a strange year. But this past week has been different again with the passing of Prince Philip and the impact that that has had on our nation, on us as individuals, and especially on the royal family that have lost a beloved husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather. This reminds us, as if we needed reminding, that in our local, physical, human world, almost nothing stays the same or remains unchanged. Family, friends, relationships come and go. We're here at this table this morning to give thanks and praise that during all the change that is happening around us, there is, there is a constant, unchanging, a certain, immovable, indisputable, undeniable truth. The truth that Jesus died on a cross for each and every one of us and rose again to forgive our sins and give us everlasting life. Lord, we give you thanks now, not just individually in our homes, but gathered here as your church for these small symbols of your body broken and your blood spilt just for us. Lord, I thank you that you made this sacrifice for millions for billions of people in this world. But you would have done exactly the same if it had been just for me. Lord, we give you our grateful thanks for your everlasting love. Amen. Taking the bread... Jesus broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we take the bread, may we see Jesus as he did, showed Jesus as he did on the road to the Emmaus for the two who were there. In the same way, Jesus took the cup and said, This wine is my blood, poured out for you. Drink it, all of you, and be thankful. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this meal. And Lord, as we have shared remotely, but together, we pray, Lord, that we may have known 
your presence with us. That, Lord, any doubts that we may have had may be behind us. And, Lord, we can trust in you for the future, whatever that may hold. Lord, we worship you, our Lord and our Saviour, our risen King. Amen. Today they're going to be led for us by Tusi and Noreen. Okay. Dear Father God, I just wanted to pray that all us kids have a happy, safe return at school tomorrow and that all the adults will get lots of work done when they are either homeworking or they are going to work. Just please be with them. Also, I wanted to ask for forgiveness for anything we might have done to upset you. And, as, um, and I also want to pray, pray for Claire Holden to feel better after her vaccine. And, Nick, and as well as Nick Wilde through his treatment and God, you're going to heal him as quickly. And we will pray for Helen as well. We also pray for Dor Dorothy Shaw, who is waiting for more tests and results from previous tests. God, we pray for Pastor Kevin for his annual leave to help a nice to have a nice re relaxation and time with his family. We also pray for church meeting later today. Let the Holy Spirit be the chairman on this meeting. Father God, we pray for John Humphrey funeral service, and we pray for her family that you be with them in this hard time. And thank you, Lord, for all her life on saving you. Lord, we also thank you for Prince Philip's life. We ask your strength for, her, for our majesty, the queen, and all royal family members at this time of grieving. We ask unity and love within the royal family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Tracy and Doreen. And now we come to our final hymn and we're going to go out with a hymn of praise. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon his throne. Rain shall know no end, and round 
And a final blessing as this service comes to a close. May the Christ who walks with wounded feet walk with us on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out our hands to serve. And may the Christ who loves with the wounded heart open our hearts to love one another. Amen.